Cracks appear in another apartment block in Sydney and residents are evacuated at the last minute. What can we do to stop a crisis turning into a catastrophe? I'm Jimmy Thompson. I write the Flat Chat column in the Fin Review and edit the Flat Chat website. And I'm Sue Williams, journalist and author. And this is the Flat Chat Wrap. Okay, Sue, we just had another cracks appearing in a building, people turfed out onto the street, not able to take their belongings or their their pets or or whatever. What do we do? What's happening? What's going on? It's horrendous that this could happen again, isn't it? So close to Opal Tower. It's just unthinkable. But then it makes you think that how many other blocks are there there waiting to be discovered with cracks waiting to be discovered as well? Well, when you think about it, I mean, the government is saying, oh, we're going to tighten regulations, which they said they were going to do after Opal. But even if they had, even if they'd brought in their building commissioner that they're talking about, would it really have made any difference? I don't think so. This was always going to happen when it was going to happen. Right. It's it's very difficult to say, because I guess the inquiry hasn't found out exactly what the problems are yet, have, have they? They haven't discovered who is responsible. It's always hard when you've got developers using subcontractors. You know, are they actually supervising them well enough? And they probably aren't, one has to think. And at a time we've got so much self-certification, that seems to be a huge issue as well. Yeah, well, certainly at the time this was built, it was back in the, the bad old days when uh, developers were allowed to choose their certifier and the certifiers, if they knew what was good for them, wouldn't not certify a building. We can't assume that's what happened in this case. We shouldn't assume anything really until the more investigation has been done. I mean, my theory is that the combination of possibly poor building, possibly the building next door has been blamed and it's sitting over the airport railway line. So there's constant rumbling of trains underneath. I don't know if they even hear them. But, you know, all these tiny little things, it's the butterfly beats its wings on the Amazon (laughs) and it causes a storm somewhere else. Sure. No, that's right. But in the meantime, you've, you've got to feel terribly sorry for the owners and the tenants who have kind of been left in limbo, really, not knowing what's going to happen. Obviously, the tenants are having to pay rent to, to live in places elsewhere. Owners who were living there are having to find alternative accommodation. I mean, this is a terrible situation. In the 21st century in Sydney, And if we get a reputation for our buildings crumbling, I mean, that's going to be awful for the future. Do you think that this is likely to be the last time we see this in the next year or so? I certainly wouldn't put money on that. Because I reckon these things are cyclical. At the very least, you know, the the regulations that pertained when that building was being built pertain to another whole bunch of buildings elsewhere. Mm. Like, and if there was laxity in the, the whole certification thing or the building practices or maybe they were pushing the envelope a little bit in terms of what could be done and they thought would be structurally sound, all builders, all the developers would be using the same sets of uh, criteria. So I think there's a generation, if you want, of buildings that could be at risk. Yeah, you're quite right. And it, it was interesting because the government said, well, this is a very different situation to the Opal Tower because... They this building was built in 2008 and Opal Tower was built in 2012. And I thought, well, it's only four years. How can you say it's a completely and utterly different situation? Well, Kevin Anderson, you know, who, who is from Tamworth. Um, our fair trading minister. Our fair trading yeah. minister, yeah. Well, I mean, for a start, he started going on about the this, this Strata Corporation. And I'm sure a lot of people were going, well, what is that? Because yes, because he was saying, yes, but we're going to talk to the owners and the Strata Corporation. Oh, right. So who are they? <laughs> who is this body? <laughs> Look, you got to feel sorry for the guy. He's got something like 55 different pieces of legislation come under his remit as fair trading. It's something that we've said many, many times, that fair trading should have its own exclusive ministry. Mm. But nobody cares. You know, nobody in the government cares. It still hasn't got to them that there are huge numbers of people living in strata in New South Wales and in Sydney especially. And it's kind of like, yeah, you can be with the guy who looks after broken toys and broken kettles and dodgy mechanics and and that can all come under the same umbrella like there's never any problem in those areas either yeah but these are people's homes we're talking about the biggest investment of their lives this is a huge issue and it should be taken really seriously when minister anderson said today that there was a crisis of confidence in the building industry i think there's a crisis of construction (laughs) 
that's, <laughs> that's, that's right. That's what the crisis is. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's check, as you said, nobody's checking the subbies. Mm. And as we know from our own experiences over the years, the developer comes in and puts a plan to council, and it gets the architect to draw the the drawings up, and everything looks fantastic. And then the next thing the developer does is to say, "How can I maximize my profit?" So the developer goes to the builder who who offers the lowest cost to actually build the building and then the builder goes to the subcontractors and they each individually get squeezed on how much they can charge for constructing the building putting the tiles in putting the flooring in putting the lighting in whatever and that's where the squeeze happens because these guys start cutting corners because they've got to make a, a profit as well. Yeah, and there's no overall oversight of the whole actual building and the whole actual process either. No, after the Opal crisis, they were talking about the certifiers being at blame. Certifiers don't go into buildings. And in fact, in some companies, they are told, don't even park your car outside the building <laughs> because somebody will say you must have been in there. And as soon as they set foot inside the building, then they become responsible for anything that they might have checked. So what they do is they sit in an office and they get the invoice or the report from the plumber and the plumber says I checked my work and it's fine and they go right check that's that's been checked that's what certifiers do you can't blame them you can blame the system because Mm -hmm. maybe they should be going into buildings and checking but they're not no that's right they're just kind of paper shufflers really aren't they well, yeah. And but most people would think, oh, a certifier will go and actually check every single thing that's happening in the building and make sure it's done properly. And that's not nothing to do with certifiers at all. So Maybe I, it should be. <laughs> well, I, maybe it should. Building engineers should be going in yeah. at some stage and should be checking the concrete pour. And they should be even looking at the architect's drawings and saying, you know, is this even possible? Because if the architect has misread the load that goes on a certain element in the building and that load turns out to be higher than it planned for, that's when cracks literally start to appear, as we saw with the Opal Tower. You know, the one element that came in there wasn't strong enough to do the job it was supposed to do. And that just just spreads. Cracks start appearing. Floors start shifting and people get thrown out in the street. Sure. But now that, I mean, now we have an official crisis of confidence, (laughs) um, maybe the government, the developers will start putting a bit of pressure on the government to try and improve the system a little bit because obviously it's going to hurt developers because people are going to have a lot less confidence in buying apartments, new apartments really. Yeah. And this is going to be a huge problem with so many of us living in apartments. It's kind of massive. Maybe we should be out in the streets demanding a new <laughs> building commissioner and a new set of regulations. And Well, at the moment people are out in the streets demanding to get in and get their cat. That's <laughs> <laughs> and, But, you know, they, in all seriousness, they, there should possibly be a moratorium on all new buildings. Just stop mm. work now. Mm. Let's get engineers in there. Let us stop this happening in the future. Mm. But can you do anything about the buildings that are already at risk. Yeah. And it's interesting because we love commissions of inquiry, I think, in Australia. Yeah. And they are fantastic. But then they write these massive reports. They have all these experts talking to them. And then the reports just get filed and yeah. nothing ever happens. So yeah. you kind of think, well, what is the point of having a commission anyway, a royal commission? Some people have been calling for that. I also think that the government has to take responsibility. I mean, if you look at ultimately who is responsible for these buildings that are cracking... And there are other buildings around. And as we know, there will be buildings that have problems and they're saying nothing. Their strata committee know that there are problems in the building and they're either hoping they can quietly fix them Mm -hmm. or they're going, let's sell out before people find out that the building's falling down. Because as soon as the word goes around, this building is suspect, then, you know, the value of the property just plummets to almost zero. Yeah. As we saw in the Opal Tower, you know, people were being offered half the mm. the value of their apartments to sell out, and I think some people were taking it too. Mm. You can't to blame them, it. can you? Really? Well, no. But heartbreaking. Well, it's not just that you've lost the value of your apartment; it's the nightmare that lies ahead of you as you try and get some sort of compensation. Mm. It's that complex and that difficult. So I think the government has created the environment that has allowed this to happen. They have to come back and set things right. They have to compensate people. 
Yeah. I but, mean, they're the ones who make all the stamp duty on, on apartments and things. They may make a lot of money on apartments. And let's not kid ourselves. One of the reasons that over the years they've been so free and easy with developers, apart from taking donations, say, bribes, <laughs> <laughs> apart from taking donations for the party, which I don't think they can do anymore, that stamp duty is a big input into the government coffers. And mm-hmm. that's what they've been looking at. Let's get as many homes built as possible because that's revenue for us. Mm. Well, you know, it's it's just not acceptable if the other side of the equation means people's apartments are falling down around That's their ears. That's right. You can't have revenue without responsibility, really. Well, you would hope not, but it seems that you can because mm. the government is making noises and so far doing nothing and the people who will ultimately pay are the owners of the building. They will pay now in terms of being thrown out of their homes and they will pay later when they have to fix it. Unless they can pinpoint one other body or one other individual group or company and say you are responsible, you have to pay for it. And assuming that that company still exists, because Mm. often when these things happen, they just disappear in a Mm. puff of smoke. When we come back after this break, we're going to talk about the tenants and how they suffer, especially in these circumstances. So this morning, a spokesman for the Tenants' Union was pointing out that the people who really suffer in these crises are the renters, the tenants. If we look at the Opal Tower, although a lot of those, funnily enough, a lot of those were Airbnb guests. (laughs) And we look at... Revenge is sweet, I suppose. (laughs) And we look at the mascot uh, situation where... You know, the local council is putting people up in the town hall and people are finding... Service apartments and things, Service apartments. Service apartments, even Airbnb, cost a lot more than a weekly rent Mm. in an apartment block. So who's going to pay for this? Who's going to pay for the difference? Well, I guess the tenants are, aren't they, really? Unless the, the government agrees to come to the party or unless they find somebody responsible. Yeah, it's the tenants. They're going to be really out of pocket, and many of them have pets as well. I mean, we saw pictures of them coming out of the building, you know, with pet carriers and things. So yeah. when you've got a pet, you can't really go and stay with family or stay with friends. You've, you've got to kind of take whatever other accommodation you're offered. And a lot of hotels will not allow pets mm. as well. Mm. A lot of Airbnb won't allow pets. So mm. uh, you're really stuck. And then, uh, you know, I would imagine that some people are exploiting this. But I hear that at the Opal Tower, for instance, there's some landlords are saying... Well, the fact that you can't get into our apartment is not our fault. You still have to pay your rent. Oh, my goodness. Now, even though the law says that the place has to be habitable Mm. and the rent can be reduced to zero if it's uninhabitable, but you're still getting landlords saying, well, we're going to take you to court, we're going to take your bond and all the rest of it. Oh, how horrendous. So you're just to add to the problems. And even if the landlord says, okay, I will get compensation from whoever, off you go and find somewhere else to live temporarily, but it's still an extra cost. It's not just mm. a hassle, it's an extra cost. And nobody is looking after the tenants. Mm. The tenants' union is kind of talking a bit, isn't it, on their behalf? But Yeah, well, they, you know, they, I can't remember the gentleman's name this morning on the radio, but he was saying, you know, there should be a fund that the government can dip into and say, well, look, we will subsidise your accommodation until Mm. the situation is resolved and then we will pursue the person who's responsible or the company who's responsible and use that to put money Mm. back into the fund on their behalf on their behalf yes but you know the government suing developers doesn't sound like it's on Mm. on their dance card at all does it no not at all especially this government yeah, absolutely. And we don't have another election for a few years. <laughs> Four years yeah, in New South so, Wales. Yeah. yeah. Look, it would be great if they, if some of the noises they're making about finding out who's responsible and making them pay up actually turn out to be true. But in the meantime, 50% of residents in apartment blocks are tenants. Mm. And that's a huge number of people. So half the people, reasonably, half the people in that mascot building are renters. They paid the rent. Now they've got to find somewhere else. If they're tight for cash, they're in a lot of trouble. They don't all have families to go to. Mm. You know, having a mattress on the floor of the town hall may not be an appropriate mm. uh, option for them. They've got kids. I've written an article for the Flat Chat website about how every building should have catastrophe planning. Yeah, that's a very good idea. 
No. Because especially if this is going to if this is going to become a regular occurrence, even. Yeah, and you know, and it's the kind of thing that okay, we all have posters up in our buildings that say, in the event of a fire, go out here, go out one of these doors, and everybody gather here you know, far away from the building, which nobody does, by the way, when the fire, fire alarm goes off, but at least it's there. But if there was some sort of document that gets prepared, gets agreed at the AGM, gets updated every year in terms of costs, that says something like, okay, here are the protocols. In the event of evacuation, this is a number to call. Here are the potential accommodation options. This is the process, the protocols that we would use so that rescue services can go in and get your mm. pets or your your medication or whatever that kind of thing so it's there so it's written down so that it's not this running around people trying to reinvent mm. the wheel sure. every time it happens i mean yeah. insurance companies could draw up a template to help buildings could yeah. They really yeah. yeah i think people were assuming that this building and other buildings like it would be covered by insurance the opal building is covered by warranty because it's new mm. but a building that was built 11 years ago is not covered by any warranties and my understanding is that for strata insurance to kick in it has to be related to an event right so okay. that you know that yeah. for it to just so if there was an earthquake or something if it was an earthquake or to, to get the difference if trucks rumbling past every day had caused the building to to crack yeah that would probably not be covered but if a truck slewed off the road and went through the shop and the yep. ground floor that then would that be. would be covered mm. because that's an event a catastrophic event which brings us to another thing the shop owners there's three businesses there that are closed who's going to compensate them mm. yep yeah. and i saw them on tv the other day and they look very distressed i mean you know they're they're quite new businesses as well yeah and that's very hard for them and they're saying, look, our part of the building isn't affected. Why are we being forced to close? And it's a very good question. And again, there's no protocol there that mm -hmm. says, look, if this building, if this part of the building is considered to be safe and access to it is safe, then people should be allowed to use it so the shop could stay open. Yeah. But we're very defensively protective in these situations where we go, nobody can do anything in case somebody gets hurt. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of overkill mm. in a way. Sure. It's not taking into account people getting hurt financially, really. Yeah. You know, that yeah. can be an enormous stress on those people. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, it's a complicated situation. It's a two parts problem, isn't it? It's what do we do about the future, the buildings that are going to be built in the future or completed in the yep. future and what do we do about right now mm. and that means the people who are affected now and the people who may be affected if this is repeated yeah and um how can we help them how can we protect them mm. absolutely and i think in view of the situation we probably won't do our funny stories at the end it doesn't of this. feel really appropriate it does no, it really no not really no. no so we'll save a few up for you for next week but uh thanks very much sue that's been really interesting yeah no thanks jimmy it's it's just a terrible situation isn't it and it's it's um good to try and find some ways of looking to improve the situation Exactly. And if you're listening, Minister, it's a crisis of construction. <laughs> if you enjoy listening to these podcasts, you can subscribe completely free of charge on iTunes or other podcatcher software on your devices. That way you'll get fresh podcasts delivered directly to your phone, tablet, notebook or computer as soon as they are posted. Please give us a rating, especially if you like the pods, and we love it when listeners pass on the podcast to family, friends and colleagues. The more people who listen, the happier we are. And if you want to know more about apartment living or have specific questions you need answered, please go to flat-chat.com.au. I'm Jimmy Thompson. Thanks for listening. Talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.